This is Reframe, the podcast from the College of Education, Health, and Society on the campus of Miami University in Oxford, Ohio. Social media gets a lot of attention these days. It can be an invaluable way to keep in touch with friends and feel connected with the world, but it can also tell us a lot about ourselves, influence our behaviors, even shape our reality, sometimes in dangerous and unhealthy ways. And it's everywhere. Take Twitter. Today, there are about 500 million new tweets generated every day. And a surprising number of those, about 10 million per day, are about alcohol, alcohol consumption, or alcohol-related messages. And that is generating a near endless well of data for public health researchers. Can you introduce yourself and tell us who you are? Sure. I'm Rosemary Ward. I'm the Associate Dean of the Graduate School and a full professor in kinesiology, nutrition, and health. And what do you study here at Miami? Broadly speaking, I study the impact of using social media and what you put on social media with regards to how much you consume different substances from alcohol to marijuana. Some of Dr. Ward's research explores the links between college students, their use of Twitter, and alcohol-induced blackouts. She's also done similar research around the COVID-19 pandemic and blackout drinking during quarantine, and even what social media can tell us about the rise in high-risk behaviors around other potentially stressful events, like politics, for example. I have data on people drinking around the most recent election. (laughs) <laughs> did that spike as well? Did it spike uh, well, around the election? It spiked. So do you, on the election, before or after? When you, what would you guess when it spiked? We'll answer that question, as well as what happens when social media makes it seem like everyone's doing it, and what you can do about it, especially if you have or work with high school or college-age students who are active on social media. For Dr. Rosemary Ward and her colleagues, Twitter became an ideal way to study alcohol-related content and its relationship to high-risk behaviors after they understood a few key features of the platform. First, not only are there a mind-bending amount of daily tweets generated, in the United States, tweets have been made public. You can make them private, but most are not. In contrast to other platforms like Facebook or Instagram, where the content is usually shared between friends, Twitter is far more openly available. The data is right there. That's one reason. The next reason why I think Twitter is so powerful is because people think they post it and then it's gone because mm-hmm. it's not the same type of feed that we get from Facebook where, you know, it's cultivated and I don't get on Facebook very often. So I get on, it's like everybody just had a baby, everybody's getting married and somebody had some major crisis in their life. But in Twitter, it's like a feed that just keeps replacing. And so people forget, they like post these crazy things about drinking or smoking marijuana, and then they forget about it because it's like way down in the feed. So as new tweets roll in, old tweets get pushed out of sight and out of mind. This makes Twitter a naturalistic surveillance tool, which is ideal for researchers who wish to avoid unintentionally influencing their study. It can also be a useful way for schools and parents to monitor student behaviors like drinking and others. And we'll talk more about that in a bit. Twitter also offers what's called an ecologically valid examination because blackouts, by definition, occur when too much alcohol blocks the brain from making long-term memories, which can lead to an obvious problem when asking someone to recall one. Blackouts, the only way we can find out about them is after the drinking event. And you have to think about it. We're talking about losing memories. So how can we ask somebody (sighs) about their memories, losing memory, and tweeting And other social media gives us that look because they're doing that while they're drinking. And so then we get this event, event level information, and we don't have to just count on the fact that what they did after, what they say afterwards is actually them realizing, oh, I didn't have a memory of that. So using Twitter can get around this too. And after controlling for other meanings of the word blackout, like those related to power outages, for instance, and through a combination of machine learning, hand coding, and help from an undergraduate research lab, Dr. Ward and her colleagues have already analyzed millions of tweets. And Dr. Ward, you've already studied this from several different angles. And first, I want to ask about your line of research that does focus on college students specifically and the alcohol blackout related content, both those who post it and those who just consume it. What are some of the key findings you found in this research? What we find is the students that are creating the content. We have about 50% of students that just lurk. 
like me, like other researchers, we just kind of lurk online and kind of watch the trends go on. But about 50% of our drinkers are just watching. So they're consuming it and being impacted by it. But then the other 50%, especially the heavy drinkers, they're more likely to create the content. So in other words, they're setting the stage. They're putting those messages out there and they are in essence informing everybody of like, hey, I'm drinking and this is how I drink and this is when I drink and this is how much I drink. And all of that has a really important picture of what we're setting up as this is the norm. And so it adds to the impact of what they're doing. And what I'm finding is that people see it in their feed, if they're monitoring their feed, and so then they feel left out. They feel like everybody else is partying. And that's the power of social media. What we're seeing is that setting of the context, the setting it up of like everybody else is doing it or everybody's doing it this way, or I have to go on social media to tell you what I'm doing so that that's the only way to celebrate or gripe. But that, I mean, to me, across our studies, what we're seeing is that just that power of going beyond your friend group. And so you're not just getting influenced by the people in your high school. You're getting influenced by potentially anybody over the world that you follow Mm -hmm. in terms of these norms. And so that context is so powerful. You've crafted this context and this experience of the world based on what you see in these platforms. And I know you primarily use Twitter, but you also say this can apply to other platforms like Snapchat and TikTok these days. And can you talk a bit about how just consuming the kind of content on these social media platforms, how do they actually translate to intentions to drink heavily or to blackout or just more actual drinking in general? One of our studies is we broke up the tweets to that we could tell were before they're drinking mm-hmm. or after they're drinking. And in the ones that we saw that was before they're drinking, people did talk about that context of, I want to go out and get smashed. I want to go out and get blacked out drunk. And when they said blackout drunk, that meant really, really, really drunk. And so we see this power of, again, committing to it. It's funny because in health behavior change literature, we say, when you publicly commit to something, you're more likely to do it. We normally mean that with like exercise or good diet. But we're seeing the exact same thing with alcohol. And so I have a study that shows that their intention to drink is strongly related to the actual drinking behavior and actual blackout. And that's pretty powerful that again, not only are you making that intention and that leads to your own drinking, but then you have that potential of setting up that stage for other people who are consuming what you're putting in that social media feed. So not only are those who post about drinking more likely to then go out and actually do it, evidence also shows that even just viewing alcohol-related content of others can influence college students to drink more themselves by falsely altering their internalized perceptions of drinking norms. And that's a key theme that runs throughout a lot of Dr. Ward's research. That is, people tend to overestimate how much and how often their peers are using alcohol, which then leads them to view high-risk behaviors as just normal and completely acceptable. So, Dr. Ward, when we talk about this type of content being so regularly presented on social media, is that fundamentally different than some of the more traditional types of media, like TV or movies, for example, that have for years also presented like maybe inaccurate or certainly unrealistic social norms about heavy drinking, especially in places like college campuses? I think that the power of advertising and the power of the media. So like advertising and movie projections of these behaviors definitely influence behavior. Mm -hmm. But what's interesting is even now you can watch TV and if someone's smoking, now they'll put a little thing at the top saying, you know, it's for mature audiences only. And so we flag it, but social media, you craft that environment. You choose who to follow, you choose who to read, you somehow feel familiar to them. Like there's a buzz to that. There's a buzz to seeing new things into your feed. And so in contrast, the advertisement definitely influenced behavior. The TV definitely influenced behavior, but we monitor that now. We've had landmark lawsuits and everything to cut all that down and to label it. But how do you label when your kid's friend posts something about drinking? Like you can't put parental controls or federal kind of guidelines on limiting certain age groups exposure to this, but it's also these false narratives of everybody's doing it. And that's, and that's really powerful is because we get this dilemma of how do you control that information? How do you restrict that from certain people consuming that who are maybe more impressionable? 
you can't right now. It's just not set up that way. And social media is inherently set up for the more popular things, things that are getting more attention to spread faster, not just viral, but like in your feed, you're more likely to get things pulled in that have had more likes by certain people in your network. And that again, creates this perception that well, everybody's doing it. So the normalizing of the behaviors see research wise is the more people think others approve or the more they think others are doing it, the more they're going to go out and drink as well. And it's not just college students or teenagers who are easily influenced by this kind of content. Adults and working professionals are not immune either. You've also done some similar research with a more recent study around alcohol-influenced blackout tweets and the COVID-19 pandemic. And part of what I think is really interesting about this study is it shows how this phenomenon is not limited to just younger adults or, or college students, those who some people may think of as being more impressionable. So can you talk about what you found in this study as well? Sure. What's interesting to me is we did data right around when the pandemic was getting just starting to have some social isolation and some breakdown. So from March to April of 2020, that's when everybody was going into social isolation, that the bars were closing. So to get access to alcohol meant drinking at home, meant drinking maybe via Zoom, but not with other people around, not physically around. So you didn't have that kind of social pressure of I'm in a bar and there's 500 other people or, and we found the same level of alcohol tweets and the same level of blackout tweets, so the more risky alcohol behavior during that period. And that was a little bit disturbing because during a time of COVID, when we're told like to make safer choices in general about our health, people are drinking to cope. And it's adults in general in the US saying, yep, I'm gonna just order some alcohol online and I'm going to drink at home. And I'm going to drink to risky levels and then talk about it online. Mm -hmm. And I'm not even that active on social media at all. But I remember my wife and I talked about feeling that sense as well, just among peers and neighbors and, and just people in your life that, oh, it's a crazy time. It's stressful time. So why not? You know, there was almost this sense of permission just hanging out in the social ether of, well, they're doing it. So I'm going to do it, too. And you know what? I've earned it because it's stressful. And I could imagine that being even more amplified if you're on social media more. I would 100% agree with that. I mean, with the stay at home order, we saw more people across different social media platforms talking about drinking their dinner, which again, drinking your dinner, <laughs> what? Uh, we saw the rise in quarantinis. So going on Zoom and drinking alcohol with your friends, but also, yes, the big thing you just said there was it's a bad time. There's so much going on. So people drinking to cope. Mm -hmm. And in the alcohol field, we consider that really dangerous because the people who are drinking to cope are also more likely to have drinking problems. When people say they drink to celebrate, that is related to higher alcohol consumption, but they have not as many problems as the people that say, I'm drinking to cope because I have so much anxiety, I have so much stress that I can't do it. So watching that and monitoring that over the last year, it's been fascinating because it's so scary that they are alone. Like we are in isolation, we've shut things down and it's still going on. In that paper, you also mentioned other past events like the 2003 SARS outbreak and 9-11 that also led to increases in higher drinking rates and even higher binge drinking years down the line, which I guess may forecast what we may be dealing with in the future after this most recent uh, COVID quarantine and pandemic. And I imagine that means this ability that social media has to normalize drinking as a way to cope can apply to any other kind of scenario or potentially stressful event. Is that something that you've looked into as well or plan to do in the future? Yes. Goodness, I could keep talking about my research. <laughs> like, there's so much other stuff. Are you kidding? Like people drink all the time and it's all over social media. Right. I have data on people drinking around the most recent election. I, yeah, then we could totally, yes. <laughs> Did that spike as well? Did it spike uh, well, around the election? Yes, it spiked. So do you, on the election, before or after, when you, what would you guess when it spiked? <sighs> Considering all the hand-wringing before, I would guess before. That's a good guess, but it actually was after. So the Saturday, the election was on Tuesday, the Saturday after it spiked when Biden was announced. 
what's the reason behind that, do you think? Because it would be like a lot of anxiety causes people to drink. So that's why I would say before. But afterwards, was it, I guess, half the country probably was drinking to console themselves. Another half might be for celebratory reasons. But <laughs> that's exactly <laughs> it. So in 2016, people drank on the day of election. In 2020, we drank the day Biden was announced for drinking to cope reasons or drinking to celebrate. So with this insight that you've been able to get from using social media and Twitter, I wanted to ask ultimately like what the ideal end game would be that you would hope would be the result of these research findings um what kind of interventions could they lead to what would those interventions maybe look like and and how would that unfold what would this mean for public health professionals for parents even for schools so one of my hopes and we've written a grant for this my hope is that we can start using these as for the people who are generating the alcohol related content and the cannabis related content we we know that that to higher levels of use with them. So the first thing is we want to be able to flag people who may post this stuff and get some, like we get ads all the time. You search for a pair of shoes and all of a sudden all your ads are about that pair of shoes. Why can't we do the same thing with health behaviors? Why can't you post something or search for something and then all of a sudden you're getting feedback about how to change your behavior so that we're more positive about it. So the messaging could be more powerful. And I feel like that's what is an opportunity here is as we make transitions, as we learn about how social media works or doesn't work, can we start giving people messages so that they are making better choices about things? So at least instead of seeing to buy that pair of shoes, they're seeing, you know, you mentioned blacking out. Have you considered reaching out to this service? Another broader implication of this is we have limited control on how children and other impressionable people experience this environment. I mean, you could limit who your kid is listening to or whatever, but they're going to see it in their feed. We see it in our feed. It's how to counter that. And it's teaching our schools and our teachers and our parents how to have conversations about social media and how what they see is not necessarily reality. Mm -hmm. That they may think that lots of their friends are using substances and using substances in this way, when in actuality, they're not. And so there's something called um, personalized normative feedback. We can adjust their norms. So it's, you think this is how much people drink. This is how much you drink. In actuality, you're drinking a lot more than what the norm really is. And so it's adjusting their expectations. It's adjusting of what they think is going on in the environment. And that has a very powerful effect of their choices in the future. In terms of the schools, it's interesting to me how schools seem to be responsible for what kids are doing outside of the school day, outside of school limits and everything. And so there is increasingly for college and high schools, responsibility for schools to monitor or get in trouble for what one of their students do on social media. So you need to have conversation. Again, you need to talk about what is acceptable, what isn't acceptable, what is a real norm, what is just a perceived norm. And again, thinking about how that interplays with stuff that they're doing in the classroom. We know that in psychology that you're not gonna remember something until you tie it to your own personal experience. And so it's finding ways to connect up with the students today about what's going online, because that feels very personal. That's very easy for them to store that memory. And how do you get that? Most people are not drinking. Most people are not having sex. Most people are not smoking marijuana. How do you get that to tie more into their experiences? Another thing you talk about, and I mentioned this very briefly earlier, but it's the use of Twitter as a naturalistic surveillance tool. And I wonder if you could explain what that means. And also, is it something that maybe schools could use for other issues? Maybe they don't necessarily have a problem with with drinking, but could it translate to other issues that they may want to monitor, like bullying or violence or mental health issues or others? That's a perfect segue. I It's naturalistic because, again, people feel like it's for a lot of the tools like Snapchat and Twitter is that they put it up there and then it disappears. So they don't really monitor or edit or remove it down versus like Instagram. So depending on what behaviors we're talking about, certain platforms are more likely 
to show you an unfiltered glimpse of what the students are doing. And I would keep that more like TikTok or Snapchat or in, for most purposes, Twitter. But for the younger generation, that's not going to be as popular as Snapchat. And so that can help them look at bullying, but it can also sexual violence. It can also attitudes towards women. It can also give them into cheating that's going on into their classroom. But it is, it's a unfiltered because they think that it gets on there and then it kind of disappears. Look at what our students are thinking. And so anything that you think is a primary concern in our schools, this would be the place to start trying to see what are, what are my students really thinking about. Any advice on how to do that? You know, like, like practically speaking, you know, with like 500 million <laughs> tweets per day generated, that's a lot, right? And, you know, they might not have the capacity to do machine learning to code them. What would that look like? How would a school go about doing that? Maybe on a more localized level. On a more localized level, Twitter is very easy because it's public. And so you can either follow the students on Twitter and you can see it as long as they don't block you from it. Snapchat's a little bit harder because you have to be friends and they'd have to accept your friend request to see it. So on a practical level, it's taking this stuff real. It's not necessarily following and being actively on there, but every school has things that are going on online. It's being mindful when these things are brought up and looking at the evidence and then knowing that's only the tip of the iceberg, that if you're seeing one or two posts about X, there's probably several hundred more out there that you're not seeing. Dr. Rosemary Ward is the Associate Dean of the Graduate School at Miami University and a full professor in kinesiology, nutrition, and health. And this is the Reframe Podcast. Thank you for listening. If you know anyone who will find this episode interesting and or helpful, please share it. Our episodes are always free, and you can find them wherever podcasts are found. Thank you.